Suicide Forgiveness, the podcast exploring the perspective of the suicide adjacent with your host, Elaine Lindsay. Today, I have an amazing guest all the way from Ireland. Welcome, Sandra. Hi, Elaine. Hello. It's absolutely lovely to have Sandra with me. Uh, not in person, we're not together in real life at the moment, but we have been in the past. I want to tell you a little bit about Sandra Losty. Sandra, early on in a different career, worked in the voluntary and community sector, offering support to people who were experiencing homelessness, drug addiction, alcohol addiction. Uh, she herself is in recovery from alcoholism, since 1995, she's been speaking publicly about being in recovery so that people can know long-term recovery is possible, enjoyable, and doable for everyone. Sandra says coming into recovery is the single best decision she made in her life by putting the drink down and picking up the tools of recovery she completely turned everything around. Now, I say that was a previous career life, yet here we are deep in the pandemic, and Sandra continues as Recovery Hour on Twitter. We'll make sure that you get that handle so you can follow her. I want to give you just a little deeper information because I think it's critically important before we get into Sandra's story. Um, as a result of her recovery, coupled with a desire to help people whenever she could, Sandra went from working on the front lines as a service provider to project management on specialized transitional housing service for people with mental health issues. Uh, voluntary work is still a part of Sandra's life, and she's engaged in voluntary services such as young people's probation support services, prison programs such as AVP, which is an alternative uh, to violence program. And she can still be found in front of large groups of volunteers delivering training on how they can engage with service users that they're volunteering with. I think it's really important to note that in her speeches that she delivered in the summer of, of 2019, Sandra achieved a Distinguished Toastmaster Award, which is the highest uh, level possible with Toastmasters International. Now, this is a very accomplished woman who I am absolutely thrilled to call friend, but it wasn't always so. And that's the story that we're going to go into now. Again, I say I am so thrilled to have you here with me all the way from Ireland. Sandra, we're going to we're going to go way back now. And I think probably it's like anything else, the best way to start is to just dive right in. So let's talk about the beginnings of your story. Sure thing, Elaine. Yes, thank you. The beginnings of my story, Dublin, Ireland, working class family. Dad worked, mom didn't. Well, as in industry. But mom had a cottage industry going. We didn't call it that back then. But she was a, an amazing knitter. And uh, she was uh, knit the most amazing patterns on Aaron's and Fair Isle and very complicated oh. stuff. Beautiful hands. I did not inherit that gift from my mother. <laughs> I have other gifts, not not that one. But there was there was five of us in the family, and my dad, when I was roughly around maybe four or five, was diagnosed, confirmed diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, and he was in and out of the mental institution, the local mental institution, which wasn't far from where we lived, but there was no direct transport to it. You know, you could get a bus so far and then you had to walk. So it was, was quite a journey uh, back in the 70s. I remember there would have been times that he was home in the house and very yeah. unwell, very unwell. And, um, 
you know, he would have had wherever his medication was, but still in delusions and still having all sorts of hallucinations. And being aware that he wasn't there. Do you know what I mean? Like being aware yeah. that there was a, a person in front of me. I knew his name was Dad, but 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 that was it. Like that that's where the resemblance stopped. And uh like one of the I wrote a little story one time, it was more about my mother, about how she actually supported him. I didn't realise this till I was an adult, but uh there was one day my aunt uh my aunt came up to visit and uh, she was a bit of a delicate flower was this aunt, you know? And uh, when, when she came in, there was this, you know, the nod, you know, how is he? How is he? And uh, my mom just said, oh, sure. He has his good days and his bad days, you know, that kind of stuff. And with that, the Angelus, if people don't know what the Angelus is, it's the, the bells of the Angelus ring are, six o'clock every evening here on the, the TV and people would stop and do their Angelus. So my, my father in his illness was extremely religious. You know, there would be right. there'd be saints he'd be talking to in the room and that sort of stuff. But didn't he come running down the stairs? Now this is quite comical, right? And I don't mean, I'm not laughing at him. It's from a child's perspective. He comes running down the stairs, forced the door open, didn't see any of us who were sitting around. The kids were eyeing the cake our aunt had brought. We were like, open the cake, open the cake, open the cake. And mammy was being all respectful. Don't open the cake, don't open the cake, don't open the cake. And then daddy runs in with the huge white fronts and a holy vest. And he's about seven pairs of rosary beads around his neck. And oh. uh, these cloth medals, which are scapulous, brown and green cloth medals, all holy stuff. Yeah. And there he is blessing himself furiously in front of the TV for the for the Angelus, you know. And I started to titter, you know, and, and Mammy just gave me that look and you kind of keep it quiet. But why I'm saying that is, is that that was normal for us. Yes. That kind of behaviour was normal. And was it that different from other people's houses? Yes, it was. But at the same time, we all adapted and we all adjusted, you know. So that's kind of the early days, that kind of um, stuff that you nearly laugh at, but was actually was actually very challenging and very, very tragic, really. You know, daddy had several attempts at taking his own life. So whatever the voices were, told him to take his own life. And he tried several times. He was unsuccessful in his suicide attempt. And I'm not even sure if that's appropriate to say that, but he, he didn't die a couple of times. Yes, that he yes. Tried. And then in March, or oh, the end of February, rather, in 1977, he came out of hospital towards the end of February. My mom was in hospital because she got to a point where she couldn't cope with him being out. So her blood pressure would go through the roof and she'd go into hospital. And then they'd get her stable and then daddy would become destabilized and he'd go into the mental institution and she'd come out. Right. So it was this. Back and forth, back and forth. So but this particular day, whatever went on in his head, I was going out to school. He bent down to give me a kiss going out to school. He was eating toast with butter on it. Oh, disgusting. Hey, butter. And as a 10-year-old, I went, ah, that's disgusting. You know, I hate you. And stormed off to school all righteous and indignant, you know. And then at lunchtime, there was some, he had some episode. I don't know specifically what it was. My brother and my sister were in the house. He attacked both of them. My brother survived his injuries. My sister had very severe head injuries. He beat her with a hammer. And then he took his own life. He died quite quickly. Like he he uh, was taken out of the house still with life. But he uh, he did. He died about five o'clock that evening. His, um, his injuries were so severe. He uh, cut his wrists and his throat. So very, very severe injuries. And Rita, my sister, her injuries were far too severe. They operated, but there was no, I couldn't she was never that. going to survive on her own. That's kind of the early, the early years. All of that abnormal stuff yeah. became normal. And you find ways to cope, Elaine. You know, you find ways to cope and escape. Nobody talks about it. That's the thing. Nobody, nobody said, you know, now look, this is not, this is not kind of normal. I'm going to stop you there because 
I think that's a really important point that you've brought up. And you talked about your very delicate aunt, which is exactly what happened back then. Because of the, the guilt and the shame and the Catholicism that many of us were involved in, um, you, you did have to kind of gloss over the things that perhaps some thought weren't normal. Mm -hmm. The thing is, Sandra, for your family, that was normal. Each of us live in our normal. And when you don't know anything else, that is what's normal. The fact that you don't like butter to this day, I'm still in shock that you don't like butter. That left a lasting impression for you because you know it had to it had to have bothered you that the last thing you said to your dad had to do with you being unhappy with him as a 10 year old you had so much to process and the other thing i want to mention is the fact that you were the youngest of the five children yeah okay Absolutely. so yeah. And you're right, you know, uh, like when I realized what had happened. So what happened was the news got around. It was all back then. It was big news. It was on the, it was actually on the news. After the Angelus, then the whole story was on the news. It was in the newspapers. A miss, miss, um, misrepresented as well. It was, it was, uh, yes. it wasn't correctly uh, reported, misreported. And what happened with me was a neighbor came up to collect me from school. And I remember thinking, why is she here? Mary Rita yeah. doesn't like her. Now, I have no reason to believe why, whether Rita liked her or not, but that's what went on in my head. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they decided anyway to take me up to the, the convent, the house on the grounds, because I went to a convent school. And they put me in this big room. And I was only talking about this during the night. I did a story slam and I, I mentioned this room and uh it was that dark mahogany wood the paneling oh, all around yeah but the table the big huge table that was nearly like a mirror it was so polished and yeah. i was sitting on this huge chair that was like a throne you know except i didn't feel very royal i can tell you no and my legs dangling over the chair and the pins and needles you know when your your legs oh, are yeah. too long and terrified to move because there's all these holy, scary pictures of all these saints that are being tortured and all. Or, you know, I didn't want that to happen to me, you know? Thoughts that go through your head, Elaine, because I remember the nun brought in, she was a lovely nun, she brought me in this apple and a packet of crisps, and crisps for us are what you call chip, and uh, we call them crisps over here. There's, there's two varieties, Tato and King, they're like the lead brand. But I remember going, oh, God, I like King, you know, and it was Tato on the plate, you know. Yeah. But I remember I remember looking at the apple going, I hate these Smith apples. and But but feeling I had to eat it, you know. Yeah. Because uh, this was like, this was now my dinner. Yeah. That's after school, it was my dinner. So then the uh, the, the priest came up, the priest who looked after the youth club came up and um, not the youth club, the choir. Father Daly, and he was a lovely priest. He brought me home in his van. This was the van we went in when we were doing choir stuff around. We all went to Father Daly's van and we're all singing off our heads. Nobody wore a seatbelt, you know. No, no. Wild in, all that sort of stuff, you know. Father Daly brought me home and uh, he said, I, he was bringing me into the neighbour who would come to collect me. And I said, no, I want to go to Agnes, who was our direct next door neighbour. And so I went in to Agnes and she just burst into tears and I was just like, oh, I still didn't know what happened at this time. So she assumed I had been told in school. Oh my God. Then the priest, I'm, I'm sure of the nun assumed, he had assumed the nun had told me, the nun had assumed he would tell me. So I still didn't know what happened. I still didn't know that oh. something had happened. I was just like, what's going on? And then my brother was there and he had his arm in a sling and I said, what happened to you? And he said, nothing. And you're like, okay. So it, I didn't find out that, I didn't find out that my dad was dead until I went to bed that night. Oh my God. And my neighbor said to me, um, you know, and say a prayer for your dad and he's up in heaven. And I went, he's what? What do you mean he's up in heaven? Right? Oh my God. 
So this is what happens. I think this, the communication is the biggest miscommunication is that people think it's happened or it's taken place. So, so that was to indicate or that was to kind of lead the way. And I hope things are different now, but that's how things were talked about. They weren't. They weren't. Exactly. You know, they weren't. Everybody else did it. Yeah. Do you know? Or, or so, people were not ready to tell a child. They weren't ready to tell a child. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And didn't know how. So then this language, I learned to speak about this this thing in code, you know, was referred yeah. to as the tragedy, you know. Yes. Uh, it was never their names. It was never the relationship we were to each other. It was just this tragedy thing. Tragedy, yeah. Yeah, the tragedy. And then we found out that Rita's uh, machine had to be turned off because basically she was brain dead the next morning. Yeah. Um, so there you go, two people in less than 24 hours gone. That thing of the last words I said to him were, yeah. I hate you. Yeah. So when I realized that he was dead, that was bad enough. But it was only the next day when I found out about Rita, who I didn't get on with. Like I was the young, I was seven years younger than Rita. So I just annoyed her. You know, I yeah. did stupid things like I messed with her makeup and I took things out of her drawer that I shouldn't have been taken out and she'd be, you know, running around yeah. the house trying to catch me and all that sort of stuff. So I didn't have that relationship with Rita that I had with my older sister, Mary. But it was when I heard Rita died that this thing came into my head that, oh my God, she's dead because of me. And he, because he did what he did because I said I hated him. Yeah. Oh my God. And so I had no idea that that went in, Elaine. Like that, that took me years to realize that this was taken away in the background influencing everything I did and all relationships I had, judgment of myself, you know, I really thought, I really, really thought, Elaine, that I had the power to kill people. If you got too close to me, you were going to die because when I was 16, I had a row with my mother. And at this point now, I shared a bed with my mother because we rejigged the house and I now yeah. shared a bed with my mother. We had a row the night before on a Sunday about making the bed. And I was all, I do everything around here. And I did nothing, like I did, I made yeah. the bed, that was it, you know. But being 16, it was everything. Had a row with her about that, and the next morning I found her dead beside me in the bed. So now I have two things to confirm. If you get on the wrong side of me, I I can You're hand gone. you, but I don't know how. I just, I just know that you die. So that was my yeah that was my kind of early years not not I would recommend it like, no <laughs> no I would not recommend that to anyone absolutely <laughs> no. not no something I I want to stop and acknowledge the fact that you have a great sense of humor and we're at a place now that you've come to terms with what's happened as my good friend and TEDx trainer, Elaine Powell says, you are actually sharing your story from your scar and not your wound. And that's why we can interject a little bit of humor because I think it's really important for people to understand you can stand and hold your breath for the rest of your life, deify what has happened and wring your hands and ask all the questions in the world but if you stop living, then you're not doing the people you've lost a service. You're not doing yourself a service. Joy and humor are critically important. And I honestly believe that's how you got to where you are today. So let's go back to that story. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's like that was in our family. Um, I'll just give you another little story about how humour yes, kind of saved the day. But the, the church that was down the end of our road was a huge church and it had about maybe 25 steps up to it. So much, like there were so many steps up to the front of it that it needed a bit of a landing. You know, it needed a yeah. 10 and then an extra five or six or whatever. And um, I remember the day of the funeral. And there was the other the other part of there was a bit of a delay in burying my dad because the church yeah. wouldn't bury him because he yes. 
he'd taken his own life. So there was a lot of advocacy had to happen uh, on his behalf. They knew he wasn't well. They knew he was a, a, a mentally unwell person. That sure he had them tormented. Like he'd be down there at five o'clock in the morning banging on the door saying he had a message from the Virgin Mary, you know, so they mm. knew he wasn't, he wasn't a well man. Yeah. You know? But he'd committed suicide and under the Catholic yeah. law or whatever it's called, um, you can't be buried on consecrated ground. So, so now my mother was in a situation where and she was so unwell, she couldn't even go to the funeral. She couldn't even attend her daughter's funeral, whatever about our feelings were about her husband. Yeah. She had a daughter who was innocent of all of this and couldn't attend her funeral, but she um so now there's this delay and and but in fairness to the local priests and the lovely uh my father was a bus conductor. Yes. And the chaplain in the garage uh was lovely, lovely, lovely man, Father Marcellus, like just lovely. If if every if every religious person carried this energy, you'd be like, that's the religious life I want to live, you know. Yeah. So they did a huge amount of advocacy and um, I, they managed to kind of, whatever, get the permission and he was buried in consecrated ground. And, um, but anyway, on the day of the funeral, and I didn't get this until years later, you know, my sister had been married in the October previous and in this church, because weddings back then were like 250, 300 people. Oh, like yeah. they were just massive events, you know? And so everybody had to stand on the steps of this church to get in the group photograph, right? So anyway, my brother, my older brother, uh, had come up from Cork. He was in the Navy. And uh, he turned around and he said, I suppose we're all going out onto the steps now for the photographs, right? And people just started laughing. But then they go, oh, God, you shouldn't be laughing. <laughs> now, I heard that but didn't get it, you know. It was only yeah. years later I went, well, that's how you you know you go sure it's a family yeah. event this is how so, we talk it's a family yeah. event you know Absolutely. so that's the kind of humor we, we got through and, and that has stayed with me i have to say it has stayed with me but what i want to say about my humor is what i laugh at is the thought process that goes on in my head you know yeah. i when you're able to kind of take a step back and go my god imagine i thought that i was responsible like yeah but it was so real at the time. And of course, now it's a different kettle of fish, you know. But that's what I laugh at. I laugh at how we can take something that's completely irrational and make it real. So, yes, the humor is is hugely, hugely important. But when I turned to drink, there wasn't much humor in that now. That that yeah. that went downhill very, very quickly. Very yeah. quickly. I had a lot to drink on. I had a lot to push down. Yeah. Nobody was dealing with anything. Nobody was talking about it. There was no support offered. There was no counselling. No. There was none of that sort of stuff. Everybody was just left to fend. You were supposed to put it under the carpet and just not deal. Supposed to put it up under the carpet. And this is where we come back to how it was described. Like nobody could, nobody could say the word suicide. No. Or take his own life. You know, oh, that's no. why. He's left that's us. Why the tragedy was the, was the, the tragedy yeah. phrase. You know, and and really what they're referring to there is what they're referring to is his, yes, his death. Yeah, exactly. His death was tragic. Suicide is tragic for, for any person to, to leave the world and their family. Yeah. But what they were saying was that an innocent person was caught up in this. Yeah. Yeah. That's what was real. And she was 17. She was a month off her 18th birthday. So, yeah, there's that coded language that you don't even know, but you know it's not okay to ask. You know, oh, it, yeah. it's not said, it's not clarified, but you know you can't go and ask questions. I remember asking my mother, what happened? And she just said, oh, it was just so, so sad. So sad. Yeah. And that was it. And And your brother, you know, that's not, no one gave him counseling. No one, because the survivor is the one that bears the burden of guilt for surviving. Uh, that had to be massive. I and think the, the impact on the family as a whole is uh, whatever cracks were there, and I don't know that there were cracks, you know, but whatever were there, Whatever vulnerabilities were there, this just tore that apart. Yeah. You know, 
So everybody literally was just trying to look after themselves. So I, I don't know their story. I don't really know what they no. what they did or whatever. But I, I do know that we didn't, there was no sense of rallying around and mm. and kind mm. of, you know, holding each other in, in that way. There was there was never a sense of that because it was so big, like it was just huge. Yeah. To and and it wasn't it wasn't the done thing. Okay? Tra a tragedy yeah. you you don't deal. Okay? That's one thing for sure back in the day. It didn't matter what it was, you didn't deal with it. Okay, yeah. you swept it away. And and because not just Catholicism, but shame, blame, and guilt yeah. are, are the huge, used to be the motivators. Children were seen and not heard. So therefore, their thoughts, their feelings, their mental state was irrelevant. You know, we're coming into a different time and it's wonderful but it took some getting used to we were even less seen or, or, or heard well yes my, my mother called me the cheeky bitch so <laughs> you know i i didn't have a sandra name i had where's the cheeky bitch you know <laughs> that, that was and anytime i was in trouble in school was because i was cheeky but i was always asking questions i was always asking why you know why that doesn't make sense so so I got that that label, the cheeky bitch. But just to go back to the thing about children, uh, I think I just remember overhearing a kind of a bit of a conversation for me and somebody saying, oh, but she doesn't understand. And you know what? They were right. I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. but nobody helped me to understand. It was like, yeah. she's too young. It, it won't affect her. She's too young. Yes. And in some ways, what I will say is I was 10 nearly 11. As a child, with the, the brain and the child's world is quite plastic, you know, so it adapts mm -hmm. and it copes, it copes quite well. And I have a very different experience than my older sister. Very, mm -hmm. very different. And I would imagine that's because of the age gap. There's 11 years mm -hmm. between us. Yeah. She was in her early 20s and I was 10, nearly 11. So on some level, I adapted in a way that was quite healthy. Yes. And I didn't have those relationships, those longer lasting relationships, even with my mother, if I'm being honest, I was 16. Yeah. Like I was a nightmare at 16. So who has a, a healthy relationship with their mother at 16? I Not don't. Me. You know, very few people do. So even when my mother died, I didn't, I didn't mourn my mother, if you know what I mean, because Mary was always my mummy. Right. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So mam mammy was mammy, but if I fell and I hurt myself or if I wanted to... You went to Mary. Do yeah. Do you know? So, so yes, children adapt in a different way, and but they adapt better when there's a transparency about what's going on. And it's yeah. so important to find that child-friendly language to help them understand yes. something big yeah. has happened and that it's okay yeah. to talk about... It's okay to say you know, I told him I hated him and to, for, for that to be okay. Absolutely. And had it been talked about, it would be a lot easier on you now. Yeah. It's, it's, it's huge. And I'm so glad that there's so many different programs around understanding yeah. children's, you know, grieving process and, you know, some, some um, therapeutic methods are there yeah. to help them process that. I went into, I went, I was quite, um, as out, as extrovert as I was in my family home, I was quite a withdrawn child and I would yeah. completely withdraw into books and I'd totally lose myself in a book, you know, totally lose myself. But it wasn't a healthy escapism. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was, it was a total yeah. fantasy life. I was living the life in the book. Some ways it saved me, but in other ways, when I was looking to escape, you know, it wasn't from a book then. Do you know what I mean? It, it was a, yeah. I'd learned that escaping helps me not feel. Yeah. But the ways I found to escape then nearly killed me. With, yeah. So how long, I guess probably after your mom died, did you really start drinking? 
So I'd already been drinking before my mother died. That it was kind of a regular occurrence. Um, particularly on a Sunday, we'd go roller skating on a Sunday afternoon and she would go to bingo. So I would make sure that just as she was kind of going into bingo, I'd be walking up the road. So it was quite calculating in many ways. Didn't realise yeah. that. You know, didn't didn't realise that. But I was already drinking regularly at that point. Oh. But there was such a disconnect and there was such a, you know, as I say, everybody was just in their own thing, um, including myself, um, just trying to manage the best we could. So after Mammy died, it went down very, very quickly. You know, yeah. within three years, I wasn't working. Um, I was in a, a quite a difficult relationship, all drink centred, all centred around the drink. That was it. Like I, I stopped working at, I think I was 20. I didn't have a job until I came into recovery. It got darker and darker. All posts moved and shift. All of those things I said when I seen people in the pub that I was in, if I ever get that bad, I'll stop. Yeah. I got that bad. And I got worse. And I'm glad that it was so quick. Got to a point where it was do or die. It was like there isn't any more. And there was no enjoyment in it. Like it's not like I was living the high life. I wasn't mm -hmm. washing myself. Soap and water and food were not part of my day-to-day -day activities, you know. So it, it it did accelerate quite quickly, but it meant I got into recovery at 28. Yes. To a lot of people, that is not quickly. Yeah. Okay. That's a long eight years for you from 20 to 28. In the larger scheme of things, that is quite quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. what was the seminal moment that really caused you to call on courage to change? I had moved in with Mary. She was living a good few miles away from where we were brought up. And um, I had, I needed to kind of, I needed a break and I needed to be away from certain people. And I went out to stay with her for a few weeks. And um, that gave me a little bit of a downtime, if you like, you know. Sure. Um, but this particular Sunday, we, uh, she had rather this kind of workshop, this holistic workshop. Uh, somebody was doing practicing reflexology and okay. kind of guinea pigs and whatever was ground. Now, I hate having anybody touch my feet. I go through the roof. So the guy who was training said, I'll do your feet because I know you don't like like touch. It's grand. So anyway, I managed to kind of relax into it and it was fine. I mean, I wouldn't be running out together, but it was for that moment, it was fine. And then, of course, we went over to the pub and uh, drank loads there. And then there was a neighbor of Mary's and we went back to their house and I drank a half bottle of whiskey. And I was so sick. I just, because I'd had that break, oh my God, shh, hit the floor straight away. But when I woke up the next morning, oh my God, Elaine, when I woke up the next morning, I actually felt like my head wasn't on my body, that it was up mm. on the ceiling and my body was on the bed. And mm. I looked over in the corner of the room and my sister Rita, who was dead 20 odd years at that point, yeah, in the room saying, Sandra, you can't go out like that. You have a hole in the top of your head. Oh. And she was wearing this beautiful Japanese collar type kind of, um, she had this beautiful Mono? satin. It was like the top, one of these kind of tops of the short sleeves and this lovely collar. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And, and she was wearing that in this, in this hallucination. So now I'm going, I know she's dead. She shouldn't be here. Yeah. Oh, my God, I'm having hallucinations like my dad. Oh, oh my God, God, I'm going to kill somebody. Oh. The fear, the adrenaline pumping in my body. And I grabbed my nephew and I said, come with me, because I was terrified. Absolutely terrified. Got on two buses back to where I was from. I had to go and get paid. I was on social welfare, government payment. Had to go back get that payment and of course once I got the payment into my hand into the pub I went hadn't been there for six weeks no breakfast no nothing oh yeah that that was that was normal that was that was that was normal started drinking because the pub's opened at half ten 
in the morning right. and started drinking and then somewhere along the line i wanted my nephew to go he was 14 at the time i wanted to go down to a pub down the road which i don't know why because i never i never moved i just stayed in the one place you know anyway i put that child on a bus two buses actually back to where he lived on the 20th of march so the clocks hadn't even gone forward for us at that point our clocks go forward at the end of march so it was still dark and cold and damp because it's ireland you know yeah. it doesn't matter what month there is in ireland it's cold and damp most of the time <laughs> sent him off home thinking it was 10 o'clock at night wow. and when i woke up the next morning and i realized i had sent that child home on two buses on his own at 10 o'clock at night I screamed, screamed up at the ceiling. I don't know if it actually came out of my mouth, but I internally I screamed and I I can't bleep do this. Yeah. You know, can't do this. Help me. And I managed to get up out of the bed and I had five pounds, was before we had euros, five pounds in my pocket, punts as it was back then. And um so every every all the other money was gone all gone and drink and um wow. yeah 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 one day gone five yeah 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 and got back to mary's and as she opened the door she said to me i hope you're here to pack your bags now mary was the last the last person mary was the last one that gave any good nanny about me and although i had prayed like like I'd never prayed before on the two buses back to Hoare, dying, shaking, trying not to get sick. I said to her, yeah, I beckon am. Cried, he cried. And as I was packing my belongings, all these secondhand clothes belongings into little little waste paper bin liners, yeah. came in and she said, do you want a cup of tea before you go? And you see when she said, before you go, it was like, dying. Mm. I wanted to say, shove your cup of tea where the sun don't shine. <laughs> but what came out of my mouth was, yes, please. I believe that that was divine intervention. Yep. Divine intervention. And when I sat at that table and I seen the look on her face, I could not unsee that look of total desperation and despair in her face. And I bro it broke me. And I said, Mary, I know now what you're talking about. Once I start, I can't stop. And that was on the 21st of March, 1995. And thank God she made a phone call and somebody came and talked to me and then they, they took me to a support meeting then that night. It's incredible. And thank God, because at that point, it, Mary had seen the writing on the wall. She was going to lose another family member. Well, I'm, I'm very grateful for divine intervention and your nephew was fine. And I'm sure it's a big strapping young man now, or not so young. <laughs> he absolutely is, absolutely is, yeah, yeah. Great, great. We still call him a young fella, great young fella, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. You've been going to meetings since 1995. As recovery hour, you are, I think, a wonderful line of defense, uh, a, a lifeline, if you will, on Twitter, where it starts for people that are in recovery, people that are trying to be in recovery, people that are walking the walk back, which I think is incredibly um, selfless. It can't be easy, but it has to be incredibly rewarding. This is not the road everyone takes through recovery. It's not, it's not often that you hear someone having lived through, quite frankly, such an incredible tragedy, only to turn around and continue to give back at every opportunity. Um, I just have to say that because I know for a fact just how giving and generous and kind you are. So on this journey, let's wrap up and leave people with 
the sincere knowledge of just where you're heading now. What's next for you? What's next? Yeah, well, Recovery Hour came around as the crisis response to COVID to bring the people we were connected with on Twitter uh, into a Zoom room, and we're still there. Um, people have stepped up to host meetings. So I don't do every night. The the hosts step up and do yeah. nights as well, and it wouldn't still be there without them. So I, I may have started it, but people have stepped up and given as much, if not more, than I have. Um, and we give people that you know that sense of you can come in sit back you don't have to put your camera on you don't have to talk see if this is for you and also see the bit of fun that we have because you know one of one yeah. of the one of the lads very often says we're not a glum lot we're not a glum lot you know <laughs> so um so where i'm at at the moment is i'm although i've done another kind of sideline or a business over the years i've been coaching people on and off for years different yes. areas holistic stuff and now i've actually trained as a recovery coach yes. you know so i actually coach people now who are in recovery and that process is is moving you know and, and we're looking now i only did a, a session this morning on recovery messaging and how we talk mm -hmm. about recovery because i like what that lady says the vain powell about the scar we talk about recovery from that scar place but not the wound, you know, because the wound is what got us here. But it's the scar. When I seen people's scars, Elaine, I heard uh, a woman talking and she said she was 20 years uh, sober. She had a car, she had a house, she had a partner. She was going on holiday. And I was just like, well, I didn't know people who stayed sober for long periods of time. Yeah. People I knew stopped for Lent or Christmas to say for Christmas. Yeah. There was always a binge yeah. at the end of it. You no, know, there was a, a drinking binge at the end of it. So I didn't know long-term recovery was possible. And that I heard that. I really heard that. So that's where I'm heading in terms of uh, coaching people in recovery, not from the drinking place. There's a, that's a crisis kind yeah. of response, if you like. But from a place where people are looking at, what do I want to do with my life? Mm -hmm. Now that I'm sober, what are my gifts and how do I bring them out? And that's where I work with people is to help them build the confidence to build that gift even more. Like I, I talk, I didn't even have to kiss the Blarney Stone, although I have kissed it once or twice. <laughs> there I you go. I was like this before. So that's one of my gifts, you know, and I know that and I want to use that really well yeah. to help people. But other people have such amazing gifts that when they come into recovery, they, they can uncover and discover those gifts that they help people in a different way. Absolutely. You know? There's something that I don't want to sort of gloss over because I think it's such a joyous thing you do. You are also a wedding officiant yes. and you have, yes, you have done more than, you've put together more than 600 couples. Yeah. That's got to fill you with joy. Oh, it's wonderful. And I had a wedding today and the couple were just so lovely. Like people say to me, oh, you're wonderful. And that was a great ceremony. I can't be that great without the couple. You know, it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, we build it on, on talking, we, we the same values and you know they understand i want to do the best for them and they trust me with their information to portray it in a particular way that re reflects them as a couple that's what it is without that i'm just i could do a little bit but i the couple are uh they're the gold dust and they're all really you know but it's wonderful to bring and be part of that milestone in somebody's life what what a wonderful uh, ceremony to be part of absolutely i think that joy communicates itself from you because when you talk it's very evident in your face um, when you talk about recovery and especially when you talk about the couples you bring together but I think the core message for everyone I think is communication we have to talk about the tough stuff yeah we can't sweep it under the carpet it's got to be put out there in the light of day. If we don't, if we don't help people 
find an avenue to express, they'll depress and repress. Yes. And and then we have another problem, you know, that masks something that's preventable. We can prevent that kind of depression. I'm not talking about all depression, but that where a person has nowhere to go when it goes in and they're we can prevent that experience for a person by providing them these avenues and pathways and people understand where they're coming from, you know, like, yeah. uh, and I, this is the last thing I'll say in this, I promise, because you, your title is about forgiveness. And people have often said to me, have you forgiven your father for what he yeah. did? And it, back, back some years ago, I may have said, yes, I have, you know, genuinely felt that I, I had, but you know what? Now on, at this stage in my life, it was never about forgiveness for my father. No. It was about understanding. Yeah. It was about understanding he wasn't an evil man. He was an unwell man. And his actions impacted a, a directly a, a person to lose their life. And then the family left behind. But it was understanding that. And my mother had a wonderful way of entering that man's world. And I didn't even realize this. He'd say, do you see such a thing on the wall then? She'd go, oh, tell me about it. I haven't got any glasses on. And she validated. Yeah. She wasn't trying to say, there's nothing there. She yeah. allowed him to speak in that way. Yeah. And that's that to me is true compassion. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that that was truly beautiful. Your your mom had to have been a very beautiful woman because that cannot have been easy. But I really love what you said there because forgiveness, as much as we have to give it to others, the person we have to most forgive is ourselves. And for some of us, that can be a Herculean task. And it takes a long time to get there. And once you do, all of the rest kind of falls in place, I think. Yeah. Yeah. The, it pulls the legs out from under the blame. Absolutely. You know? And blaming doesn't help in any way. And taking no. over responsibility doesn't help, you know. No. Um, and sometimes we feel if we're not doing that, it's like, well, I'm, I'm, I can't be doing it right. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's not about doing it right. It's about... No being okay with how you are and remembering those people with loving, fond memories because they're there. Oh, absolutely. And it's doing it right for you. Because right to me, the true right is where you feel at peace with, with your decision, with your what you've communicated. That's what's right for you. It may not be right for anybody else and that's just fine you have to get to that place within yourself yeah. before you can communicate with anybody else. And, and I have to say, you communicate beautifully. I like to wrap up our talks with a little tip, a tweak, a suggestion that you can make uh, for the audience because I firmly believe that we should choose life, that we should keep breathing, and that we should develop a gratitude attitude. So what would you like to add to that? I'd like to add that everything is temporary except death. Everything is temporary. There are, there are ways out and there are people who are holding their hand to help you out. So look for those people. Look for those people that say, do you want to talk about it? Take them up on it and say, yes. They're there and they could very well be the light in the dark that you need to help you come out of that dark place. But they're there. That's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I want to thank you so much. This is Sandra Losty, my dear friend. I'm just absolutely blown away. I thank you ever so much. This is Suicide Zen and Forgiveness. We'll be back with another guest and we will once again 
allow our guests to share their story and lighten their burden. And until next time, make the very best of your today every day. Choose life, keep breathing, and develop that gratitude attitude because there's an awful lot that we can be thankful for. Brought to you by Truel Social Media, the digital integration specialists. Let's get you on page one.